So I'm David Kaneda. Uh, I didn't make this sketch, actually. Somebody else did. But um, I was the creative director at Censure for the past three years. How many of you guys know Censure? Yeah, all right. Um, how about JQ Touch? I made that forever ago. All right, yeah, you're all kind of like embarrassed because you're like, that, that old thing? Um, but yeah, I've been doing some of this stuff in mobile, making websites that feel like apps for a while now. Um, I'm also just curious, I killed it. Also just curious, how many of you guys were here about uh, five months ago? We did something very similar, HTML5 DevCon? Ah, oh, like none of you, like a handful. I should have just repeated the same deck. Anyway, we're gonna talk about HTML5. Uh, I could get into the whole stack thing and how we're approaching native and you know that whole bit, but I guess I was kind of brought here to talk about design. Uh, so this is about design. So this is what the web used to be. Um, not even that long ago, like 15 years ago maybe, tops. Um, you know, links were blue, there were brochures. Uh, Basically, every, every website was the same thing. It was a brochure that linked to other brochures. Um, and there was actually something kind of nice about it because it was simple. Things were clear. Like an app was something you launched and you know, had a function. And then this was where you got, went and like, read articles and you know, looked around. Now, the web can do stuff like this. And this is a Sentia Touch app. Um, which actually is also deployed in PhoneGap, but uh, I'm showing it right now in the browser. So literally, this is something running in the browser, and it's a web app. It's just HTML, CSS, JavaScript. They made that whole keyboard in CSS, that number pad. Anyway, you get the idea, right? It's, it's a bit different than, than where we were at 15 years ago, and it's a bit easy to see why there's this sort of confusion over what is a web app, what is web, what's native, what's in between, all that. So we're hitting a little bit of an identity crisis, I think. I mean, I think most companies I talk to and work with already have a brand issue, already have an image problem in one way or another. And to come into this, you know, sort of app or mobile web world and face the second issue of are we an app, are we a website, just compounds that problem. So in order to solve it, I'm gonna start at some of the basics, some design 101. If any of you guys started with like a design background, this will seem familiar. If not, hopefully it just sheds some light on uh, what it's like to design this stuff. So first thing important to know is design is a language. Uh, it is not made up of words but rather symbols and colors and things like that. If you were to look at stop signs from all across the world, uh, you know, you find some patterns. You find similarities in color and shape. Uh, some of them, in fact, are triangles. They look a little bit more like yield signs, but, but a vast majority of them feel very similar. And this is kind of important. I mean, this, at some point, even before the huge digital revolution, uh, you know, the world as a whole decided it's important that when people are driving to be safe, we have a consistent schema for how these things look. Form follows function. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah, boring. Uh, so this is like designer speak as a way of saying if it doesn't work, first and foremost, uh, you know, the way you decorate it doesn't matter so much. This is a good example of that. This was you know, the most successful, ugliest thing I could think of. Uh, you know, they actually just mentioned like a day ago or something, um, they're gonna hire a, like, a designer and get a proper redesign, hooray. But, uh, but it's pretty amazing that it's remained this popular for so long without even an API, no less. But uh, you know, people just screen scrape the hell out of it. But, uh, you know, blue links, it's, it's basically the same as the first screen I showed, right? Blue links, directory listings, pages, content. Um, but for this type of thing, it works. Bless you. And this is, this is probably my favorite thing. And, and 
I'm totally stealing this from Heffler Frere Jones. Um, Jonathan Heffler gave a presentation like a year ago talking about typography and how form files function and digital typefaces and whatever, and I'm totally ripping that off right now. Um, but the important thing is the idea of something, the concept of something is completely different from the form. The form is the manifestation. The idea of a to-do list app has nothing to do with checkboxes or things being crossed off. Uh, the idea of a to-do list app is a series of things that you would like to do and your ability to mark them as complete. So in this, in this sense, a website and an app both however you build it, web or native, are all part of the form. They don't have to do with the idea. And I apologize, without like the presenter notes, I'm just gonna have to like see what the next slide is and then wing it. Uh, so to take this a step further, you add context in. Context is sort of the filter that turns an idea into the form. And so if a website or an app is our final form, the context is really the OS or the screen that we're on. You know, right now the web is seeing this huge revolution in that it's, it's in your TVs. Google wants it to be in your frickin' eyeball. Uh, you know, and then even on top of that, if you look at the web as accessed within a browser, you also have the OS to deal with. Um, you know, are you on iPhone, Android, iOS, Android, whatever. And so if we go back about 80 years at this point, back to some of the old sort of rock and roll hatch, hatch print posters. Uh, you know, design at that time and knowing your context and, and creating a form meant knowing the printing process super well. It meant using that printing process to create some of these effects and knowing your limitations and sort of embracing those constraints. Bringing it forward to today and, and sort of back to that to-do list metaphor, uh, this is things, this is the to-do list app I use. It's pretty featureful, but also kind of clean. It's uh, kind of along the GTD methodology. Uh, but this is almost, you know, a literal adaptation of what you would consider a to-do list. If you had a blank sheet of paper, you could pretty easily see throwing out some check boxes and, you know, writing down the things you have to do. They take it a step further and sort of embrace the idea aspect and say, once you've completed a to-do, that, that item is of much less interest to you. So we're gonna gray those out. This has nothing to do with a real world interpretation of you creating a to-do list pen and paper. Um, you know, they gray out the check boxes, they add different color check boxes, stuff like that. Th on the flip side of this, if one was to take the idea of a to-do list and really, almost as Andrew was saying, take out everything unnecessary, take out all the decoration, you would end up with something like Clear. Um, Clear is a to-do list app that launched on the iPhone. I think it's been ripped off like 50 times so far already. Um, by the way, I, I took this slide out, but uh, as I was doing some research, there are 720 to-do list apps on the iPhone App Store. Just saying. <laughs> Don't enter that market. Um, so. What Clear did was say, we're going to leverage gestures to basically boil down a list to, seriously, its most basic form. You know, they add some of this color gradation for style and effect, but ultimately, you just have rows, just rows of stuff that you need to do. And I guess, you know, oh, I'm just diving ahead. So as web apps and, and looking to leverage web technology, uh, you know, our context is growing daily. Again, with the Google Glasses thing, um, we don't know exactly where stuff is going to be or what we're going to want to target soon. Um, and also, just to come back to that to-do list thing, uh, I'm not here to say really which way is better than another. Uh, like I said, I use things. I love the minimalist approach of Clear, uh, but it doesn't have enough features for me. And that's kind of, as an aside, I kind of worry about, you know, is the sort of uber minimalist thing that's coming up in Android and Windows 8 gonna be enough to support some of the more featureful apps? It's gonna be interesting. So anyway, coming back to context, 
on the web, we have a completely dynamic context. Basically, once you strip away that browser Chrome, that whole sort of big rectangle in the middle is ours to play with. Um, you know, if you were to think back to, I don't know, Amazon 10 years ago, uh, you know, we all made really ugly stuff, like, all the time. There's not a person in this room who hasn't made an ugly website at some point, I would imagine. Uh, we kind of had the freedom growing up with the web to, to do whatever we want. If we wanted giant, glossy, orange buttons, we made giant, glossy, orange buttons. Uh, an app, though, for a while now, has had this other context. You, you've always been given this room to sort of play and, and you know, move around, but, but really, an app has always been much more bound to the OS and, and tied in terms of the visual language it uses uh, to the OS. And now we have a web app, and, and again, this is coming back, this is the identity crisis we're in. How much of the native OS do we want to recreate? How much of our brand do we want to utilize? Where do we fall in between? So I guess my most important message of anything uh, would be to know your context and know where you're targeting know where you're deploying. Um, and again, as a pure web app deploying through the browser, this is incredibly difficult and uh, you could almost say impossible uh, to know what the browser is going to be. Even if you were to say smartphone, for example, you know, most of us think of a sort of vertical rectangle right away, right? You think either the iPhone or one of the billion Androids. Uh, but a lot of you pro probably don't think about the Blackberry with the sort of horizontally rectangular screen, uh, where now they have a great web kit in there, but you're still constrained to about, I don't know, 500 by 250 pixels, um, enough to see your top banner ad. Uh, so we have this scale, right? I'm sure you guys have seen a million, this is like the most simple thing I could throw together. Uh, you know, all the big players use both sides. A lot, you know, Twitter, Facebook, they'll have native apps, they have web apps. Um, but really, the importance, and, and I'm sure all of you guys get this because you're here at an HTML5 conference, uh, the importance and, and the real benefit is coming out of the HTML5 and the web side right now. Uh, you know, if you wanted to make the devil's advocate argument, you could say, what about Instagram? They did pretty decently as a native app, right? I mean, they were like iOS only, native only for forever. Um, but to that, I would say, look at who paid a billion dollars for Instagram. Uh, it's a web app. It's been a web app forever. They just launched within the past year, they launched their first native app, which was the iPad app, and uh, or the iPhone app. and. Uh, you know, and they just came out with a thing last week saying they're still getting twice as many visits to m.facebook.com as they are to all of their mobile, native mobile apps combined. So, for whatever it's worth. Uh, if you are targeting the browser, if you're going straight to the browser, also, I'll just take an aside. One of the benefits of coming up here and talking for 20 minutes is I don't have to have the whole answer, and so, all this stuff, these are just ideas to go off of, you know, so I'm not going to give you a final, you know, everything has to be a hybrid app and built this way. Uh, I just want to look at how we use HTML5 and, and how we design with it. So this, I just want to stop hearing, the whole one web thing. How many of you guys have heard one web as a thing or responsive design? Really? Not a lot. All right. Uh, well, it's a big thing, apparently. Uh, you know, the big example lately is the Boston Globe. Uh, and so they redesigned recently. They use media queries now. So the cool thing is, you know, this is the site that you get on the desktop. And then when you go to mobile, you get something like this. So the whole thing sort of reformats itself. The nav collapses into a menu button. Uh, and for the vast majority, they do this with CSS. And this is cool. It's a great technique. It's, it's, I kind of compare it to something like CSS sprites. It's a technique, it, it leads to best practices, but it's not a solution in and of itself. Ultimately, this is what you get uh, when you're loading the Boston Globe website. If, if you're using an iPhone, which has a pretty tall screen, pretty good pixel density, uh, that top part is the screen that you see. 
And then to get to that article down there, uh, you scroll to it. And, you know, as an experienced designer, I would say there are better ways. There are better ways to utilize your screen space. Um, you know, there, this site came at it from the approach of what are the tools available to us. And again, as a website that's basically reformatting itself for mobile, they did a great job. But to say this is the experience that you should get on mobile, whether it's on the web or not, uh, isn't right because we can do better. So this comes back to some of that form follows function stuff. You should know basically what you're doing. And I didn't have enough time to make good graphics there. So I'm just going to say know what service you're providing and look at it within the context of the industry. It's, it's interesting to look at how people use web apps in the browser versus uh, apps or hybrid apps that they get through the app store. Uh, if you are in news uh, publishing or, or you're in e-commerce especially, uh, people still put way, way more value on the browser interface. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any good numbers, but if you look at the usage of e-commerce sites versus apps, it is still heavily, heavily on the site side. Whereas games, even social sort of in between, uh, fall more to the native side. Another quick thing to note, if you are developing in the browser, that browsers impose the design language, the, the design language of the OS that you're in. Even in that zero video I showed earlier, uh, or twitter.com, you know, they put in a little JavaScript so they hide the uh, location bar right away. But you're still stuck with that little bar at the bottom, and you can never get rid of that thing in the browser, right? So no matter what, you are going to have this light blue glossy thing with recessed icons with a one pick shadow heading upwards. And it's worth keeping that in mind um, and knowing that that's what's going to be around you at all times. Again, context. Now, if you go the other way and you want to use a native wrapper, you want to use PhoneGap uh, and get into an app store, but use web technology, it's important to remember, that's too late, uh, every OS has its own language, has its own design language. And I highly recommend every major operating system right now is actually getting better, uh, pretty much led by Apple, obvi, uh, at having some form of interface guidelines. And I highly recommend reading them all if you're getting into this field. Um, I will fully admit I haven't read the BlackBerry one yet, uh, but uh, Windows 8 Metro, Android 4, uh, Apple's HIG human interface guidelines for iOS and everything, uh, they all have great tips and great ideas, and there are a lot of similarities within them. People like to criticize web apps because, you know, the mystery meat, the, you know, you're faking being native, but really at the end of the day, that's up to you to decide how much you want to fake or not. You know, one quick example would just be iconography, uh, symbolism. You know, it's interesting that certain symbols like the magnifying glass and the trash can are basically set. You know, there's a few very subtle differences in, oh, by the way, if you didn't know, uh, Android 4, uh, iOS, and Windows 8. Um, but search, trash, these things are common, and, and I think because they've been around for so long, we've all kind of consolidated on them. Interestingly enough, share, which is m a newer concept to the web, or to computing almost, uh, is the one that's the most different, that everybody's basically thrown out an idea. I, I find it really odd that Windows 8 went with a gift when, <laughs> when they're going, and, and I think they're doing a phenomenal job, but like they're going for the most minimal UI that has ever come out, like the UI language or system. And so to go with a whole like fake box with a ribbon, I just find surprising. But uh, it's also kind of interesting to see the progression of the bookmark icon, how it somewhat s relates to a book and then somewhat just relates to a favorite, a, you know, the star. So I have to give Android props on that one because I think the way they mixed a literal bookmark and a star is beautiful. Um, but anyway, you're not here to just 
hear me talk about icons all day. So sometimes, you know, you could basically, you could take that example, icons, and you're making your web app and you want to wrap it up in PhoneGap and deploy everywhere. You could go through the trouble of actually differentiating the search magnifying glass based on which operating system you're on. You probably don't want to. It's, I mean, that's half the benefit of the web is, you know, cross-platform. So, you know, one good example, and this is coming from the desktop, but we have modals on the web as well, or on mobile, so. Modals on mobile. Uh, so, you know, the, the important thing is to take, take existing concepts and think them through. This basically, dialog boxes, have been a problem for desktop designers, for cross-platform desktop designers for a long time because the two main operating systems, Mac and PC, have always done the exact opposite thing and they continue to do so. Uh, the Mac will always put the confirm or sort of the you know, go ahead action on the right and Windows will put it on the left. Uh, this article came out, I stole these graphics from an article that came out about a year ago uh, talking about why the Mac way is better. Now obviously we're designers so like we all always think the Mac way is better, but the research they did was very beneficial and, and this is what I would recommend you do when you come across some of these circumstances where there is no technically right answer, there is no uh, platform consistency to follow which is to think it through. So, you know, essentially, if you haven't gathered it already, the, the gist of it is, if you have the OK button on the left, you have to bounce back and forth if you want to proceed, basically, because we read left to right. Obviously, this all changes in different languages, but we're not going to get too crazy about it. Uh, you know, so you have to, f you first look at the OK button, then you look at the cancel button, then you realize, I want to hit OK, so you have to go back. Uh, in terms of, you know, your eye and, and sort of the speed at which you can comprehend things. Uh, having the okay on the right is better because you go in one direction. It also, as a follow-up, represents the directions which you're going, basically. So right is forward and left is backwards. Uh, in addition to that, again, this is basically sort of the top point re-illustrated. As you're taking in the whole design element uh, altogether, you're reading left to right. And so, again, it just follows your sort of normal scan line. And this is the kind of research you know you should be doing as you start to think about how you want your app to feel across all the different platforms. All right, so skeuomorphism versus minimalism. Uh, how am I at on time? Just curious. Okay, because this one takes about an hour. No, uh, th this could literally be its own thing probably. Uh, so, for those who don't know, skeuomorphism is, you know, I should have gotten the fancy Wikipedia thing, but basically it's an artifact, a visual artifact of something that doesn't actually have to exist within a design. Uh, you know, Mac basically, Apple has been going crazy with them lately. Uh, again, I'm not here to say what's right or wrong. Uh, you know, so our address book on the Mac is literally looks like an address book. It has a little bookmark thing. Uh, you're kind of like, how is there a search bar in my address book? Uh, but you have the stitching inside the middle. Um, and then to contrast that, and this is seriously one of the most worrying and interesting things happening in, in UI design right now, is you have Android 4, where an address book looks like this. Um, you know, basically the complete opposite. Uh, and, and how you mitigate you know, that difference if you're targeting both platforms is gonna kind of fall onto you. Just to reinforce, you know, here's just Windows 8 versus Mac. You have a, on the Mac you have a glossy 3D dock with little glowing orbs to represent the apps are on. Uh, and all the apps have a shadow and a very set angle that you're supposed to be looking at the apps, sort of like a 15 degree, you know, if you're looking down on it. It's very set. And then on uh, Windows 8, you have uh, some rectangles and shapes. And I, I don't mean that critically. I, I actually think it's totally beautiful. But, uh, but it's a tough problem. 
So my only recommendation, as if you run into this and you're starting to battle, start on the minimal side. It can be very easy to want to do something like address book or you know, even garage band if you're gonna get crazier. Um, but the problem is you'll probably end up with something like this, and that's just the last place you wanna be. Um, so really, I, I mean, Flipboard, I should have included some more screenshots because there are other good examples in here, but I, I would say Flipboard is probably uh, one of my favorite iOS apps. Definitely, I think, the most amazing iPad app out there. But it's basically always looked like this, um, which is interesting because they, and I really need a detailed view, but um, essentially they use some of the conventions from the OS that they're on, iOS, uh, meaning that magnifying glass is the exact right magnifying glass for, for iOS. Uh, but generally, everything else is custom, and it's very minimal. And there is some texture in that uh, little bookmark thing that you can pull out on the top right there. There's a little sort of ribbon texture, there's a little shadow to it, and then everything else goes back to rectangles and boxes. And I think that's like a really nice sort of mix uh, between form and function. Even the, the covers, uh, the way that they show, this is an RSS reader, by the way, uh, sort of, for those who don't know. Uh, the way that they put the titles on top of the photos, and all of the titles have this little three pixel shadow, black shadow underneath of them, that serves a significant purpose. If your photo was white, you would not be able to read the text you know, on top of it. And so they add just enough depth so that everything works, and they can work with dynamic content. But again, it almost comes back to what Andrew was saying. It's, it's about just doing enough. Um, however, on, again, to present sort of the other side of that, uh, to have some texture, to have a little ribbon, uh, to use skeuomorphism, can be a purpose in and of itself. You know, our, our purpose as an app isn't just to function. A lot of times it's to convey an emotion. A lot of times it's to make a user feel comfortable with a technology that they're not used to. And that actually is a big reason why I think Apple has been using Skewermorph so heavily, especially in the iPad and iPhone world. Uh, it makes these apps more familiar off the bat and, and less scary uh, to, I guess you could say, the sort of very old or very young, um, those who are like new to computers or those who are new to touch devices. Uh, you know, having your address book feel like a book or look like a book, having iBooks where you turn the page and it, it matches, gives you a feeling as you use it. And that feeling helps your user, believe it or not. And it helps your brand. Uh, last thing I'll point out before I'm finished, uh, Twitter does it really well. You know, there's a couple things. One, they, they set on a definitive, we're gonna use top tabs only. And that goes against the iOS standard. Even on iOS, as you load up the mobile Twitter site in your browser, the tabs are on the top, which is unfamiliar to most iOS users. It's actually the default for all the Android users, but it's still perfectly usable. And you could almost say, and I don't wanna like suppose I know what's going through their heads, uh, but you could almost say they did it because of the context as well, because they knew that they could get rid of the top bar, but not the bottom browser bar, and so now their app is balanced. They have a top toolbar, a bottom toolbar, and the middle content. <clears throat> uh, the other thing I'll point out is the home icon is basically, again, a generalized, uh, acceptable version of home, you know, which is very common iconography that's established, but they turned it into a birdhouse to import their brand into it um, and, and sort of made it a brand piece on its own. They don't go with edge-to-edge -edge lists on the mobile, which actually I disagree with because that's just everywhere and they're kind of just wasting space. It's not really a brand thing to have a little gray bar around everything, but um, anyway, I'm just gonna keep plowing through. So ultimately, in conclusion, uh, there is no answer. <laughs> uh, this book by Mike Montero, uh, Design is a Job, actually is completely not about what I'm talking about. It's about getting paid and stuff like that. But, uh, but I mean, this is why designers are here. And uh, hopefully this is just shed, if you need a designer, some things on you know, what they should be thinking about and, and the type of designer you wanna look for. So that's it.